uh, the viewpoint. Well, we, we, we have people who damage parts of their brains, and they go back to existences that are like, yeah, rather like also, Ludwig's. Yeah, <laughs> but you also have humans who don't have a sense of, of, of who can't see at all, who are just as conscious and just as literate as, yeah. as anyone else. No, here's, but, here's a well, data point. They're, they're, they're conscious, but in a different they, way. Here's a data point. Let's see what humans can do without the aid of culture. A lot of what makes us as smart as we are is the cultural apparatus and substructure we've had built up in our society. That's largely made possible through language and through communication. With that, we're smart, we're all smart. We can stand on the shoulders of our ancestors and we can see everything. Now you bring me up in the wild without culture, without much in the way of culture, without much in the way of language, you see how smart is, is I am. It, is this a personal data point? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a data point for each of us, right? But you, you see, see how smart any of us is without when culture. When we say language, we just don't mean making noises through our mouth, but things like money, property, marriage, government, the stock market, interest mm -hmm. rates, uh, uh, Congress, elections, uh, all but uh, cocktail parties. you're relating all of those things back down to language. Absolutely. You cannot have those without language. But Given but a capacity to express yourself in language and a capacity to store linguistic data in written language, that's a tremendous revolution. Given that, culture becomes possible. Okay, we now have animals on this same general <coughs> spectrum of humans. Now we add the new hot area, which is computers, and uh, the software of massive parallel supercomputers. And the big question of the moment is, can computers become conscious? John? <laughs> well, um, I, I've been in an argument with these uh, people. I and would of course, hope so. Yeah, and, and the, answer, the short answer is no. Uh, because if you define a computer in, in, in the classic sense as a device that manipulates formal symbols, usually thought of zeros and ones, then that by itself is not enough for consciousness and mental life, because that's purely formal. And this, Are you the, making the, the difference between analog and digital? And digital no, can't no, be and analog no, can no, be? No, it's not. It's a, a digital and a, analog is the difference between syntax as a bunch of symbols and semantics as meaning. And there's a, there's a one sentence proof of that. It's kind of a long sentence. But anyway, if, if you imagine that you are the computer and imagine a task that you don't know how to perform. I, I don't know how to speak Chinese, for yeah, example. Go into your Chinese room. We okay. want, we want to hear you talk about Here we are in the Chinese that. room. Uh, it, if I imagine myself locked in a room and I have a rule book in the form of a computer program that enables me to answer questions put to me in Chinese. So the Chinese symbols come in and I look up in the rule book what am I supposed to do and I give back Chinese symbols. It's Chinese. Here we are. Okay. Chinese. I look at, I, the symbol comes in and I look up in the book what I'm supposed to do and I give back Chinese symbols as answers. To people outside the room it might look as if I understand Chinese, but I don't understand a word of Chinese because all I've got is the symbols, the syntax. Now, and this is the point, this is the end of the sentence. If I don't understand Chinese on the basis of implementing the program for understanding Chinese, then neither does any other digital computer on that basis, because that's all a computer has. The computer is a device for manipulating formal symbols. They, that's the what power of it. You look inside a computer, and John's right, you don't see any semantics. But look inside a brain. You see a bunch of neurons interacting here. You, you see any semantics in there? Yeah, if it, Do you see any meaning? Somehow, and we don't know how, all those neurons interacting manages to give rise, rise to a conscious, meaningful mind. Well, exactly. What's, what's I don't see a difference it, in principle between yeah. neurons, which are wet, and silicon chips, which oh, are dry. Okay, I will tell you exactly the difference. Why is wet versus dry matter? I'll tell you exactly the difference. We're listening closely. The brain is a causal mechanism. Computation does not name a causal mechanism. It names a formal symbolic mechanism that can be implemented in a causal mechanism. A computer, now, is, a computer is a causal mechanism. Yeah, you mentioned silicon. Computation has nothing to do with silicon. Uh -huh. Computation is an abstract formal process that we currently in our backward technology have found ways to implement in silicon. I have no objection to the idea that silicon might be conscious, but silicon has nothing to do with computation. Computation names an abstract, formal, symbolic process that we can implement in any medium, whatever. Silicon. Well, I think the interesting, uh, the interesting claim about the about artificial intelligence, I guess, it's a possible claim, is that what matters to the mind isn't the meat. It's not what it's made of. It's the patterns, and that's the structure right. which that meat makes up. And you replace that meat in my brain, you know, neuron by neuron, with silicon chips. You're going to have a. You're still going to have a causal mechanism. You're going to have a different yes. causal mechanism. It's going to have the same kind of structure, and at the end of the day, it might be it might Th be a silicon that, machine. That's the current Who's politically correct. Oh, right. Wait, uh, right. is, is, my is my consciousness going to fade out okay, along the but, way? Is it going to suddenly weak out? Look, let's look closely at that. Right. You see, what you've said is, 
if you had one causal mechanism, the brain, and mm -hmm. you placed it with another causal me mechanism made of silicon, silicon. it's a f an empirical, factual question, not something we could settle mm -hmm. a priori, whether or not the silicon would be conscious. I think that's fine, but that's What do you not, think is fine? You think I it, think it's fine to hypothesize that, that you might could be. create consciousness in some medium other than meat. Do you think you can? I, I don't think so. I think it's out of the question. Well, you but don't that's think a, you can? That's a factual th thesis on my part, not a philosophical Ooh. proof. The philosophical well. proof goes as follows. Just having the formal symbols, abstract zeros and ones by itself, isn't sufficient to guarantee the presence of consciousness. But any computer is more than zeros and ones. Any a computer is not just symbols. A computer Compu is a bunch of voltage. Computation is which not are interacting with in each terms other. of voltage. We have to take a prediction. Fast forward 100 years. What's the new relationship 100 years from now between the mind and the brain, Barry? There won't be a new relationship. We'll sure know a whole lot more about the mechanics of how the brain generates these things. And Dave? We'll have a really good set of correlations between processes in the mind and the brain. We'll have a set of abstract principles to bridge the domains. Fred? Within 50 years, we're going to have truly artificially intelligent computers that will be conscious. No. We as a culture will become so dissatisfied with this mechanistic metaphor that has deprived us, uh, deprived us of the poetry of being unique human beings that we'll throw the whole thing in the... Uh, the, the, the trash bin. In 50 years, we will know the neurological correlates of consciousness. In 100 years, we will know which of those correlates are causal. Most researchers explain mental activity in the purely physical terms of neuroscience as electrical impulses and flowing chemicals, thereby reducing the mind to the brain alone. But others contend that the mind maintains an independent existence beyond the brain and outside the physical and is a fundamental, unknowable element of reality. Our enduring paradox is that we're forever destined to use the mind to study the mind. And so we continue edging closer to truth. I'm Robert Kuhn.